thanks, uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. And uh, and on behalf of Skybridge, um, thanks so much uh, for for being here at this very special salt uh, in New York. Um, I have a uh, I have a great panel today. We're talking about uh, the, the title is Alternative Income in a Zero Interest Rate World, but it's going to be a little bit, you know, uh, uh, broader than that. We're going to talk about you know some interesting segments of the credit market generally and, and yields, but also just opportunity sets. Um, I would like to uh, to introduce my fellow panelists, Clay from Exonic, uh, TJ from Angela Gordon, and, and Aaron from uh, from Monroe Capital. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to them to, to just give a, a bit of background on uh, on their firms and themselves um, and what, uh, what they invest in. Um, and then from there, we'll talk a bit about markets. Clay? Great. Uh, Clay Di Jacinto, Exonic Capital. We've been around since 2009 and manage about $4.5 billion uh, solely in structured credit. Uh, we do this through a couple of LP products, uh, some funds of one and, and, uh, and single asset funds, and also uh, two registered products, a mutual fund and an interval fund. Uh, TJ Durkin, um, Angela Gordon's a $45 billion global alternative asset manager. I've been around since 1988. I've been with the firm uh, 13 years. Uh, we focus exclusively on credit and real estate, and uh, I oversee our structured credit business, which is about uh, $6.5 billion of the AUM. Great. Hi, my name is Aaron Peck. I'm a partner at Monroe Capital. Monroe manages just a shade under $11 billion. Uh, we're headquartered in Chicago. We're best known as a lower middle market uh, lender. So we're a direct lender, lending money to small companies, typically generating between three and $30 million of EBITDA. Uh, we offer products everywhere from large institutional products down to uh, funds that can be invested by accredited investors. Great. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. So, um, so to kick it off, so obviously we're in an, a, a, uh, an incredibly uh, low yield environment. Um, you know, you're at you're, you're basically at all time uh, low yields for for on the run. You know, high yield credit, and you're you know you're 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 close to all time tight spreads, not at all time tight spreads. Um, and there's just very little. There's very very little places for folks to to generate yield without some trade, right? Complexity or less liquidity. Um, but I, I think that creates, um, I think there are exceptions to that kind of generic statement that, you know, we're in a low rate world. There are definitely pockets of the market that are really, really interesting, offer higher yields without utilizing leverage to get there. Um, but they require specialization. And when I think about, you know, your respective firms, um, you do a really, really good job at that. And you're, you're involved in segments of the market um, where there are opportunities, right? So uh, maybe we'll start uh, with you, Aaron. Just talk about what you know. Develop a bit. So when you say middle market direct lending, what that means, right, for for the audience here. But then talk a bit about like what the what the unlevered you know yield and total return profile of you know a typical portfolio you you could put together today. What that looks like. Sure. So direct lending is just what it sounds like. It's a pretty simple business. At the end of the day, we loan money to small companies. Uh, we're typically senior secured first lien lenders. So we're doing what banks used to do. You know, it used to be that you go down, you, you run a small business in your town, you meet with the local banker, you, know, you play around a golf, you tell them you need to build a factory or you want to buy your competitor and they'll lend you, you know, some money against your cash flow. That market completely went away, um, you know, after the great financial crisis and the Dodd-Frank rules and, you know, all the direct lenders sort of grew up in that market and expanded their offerings and Banks really aren't in that market. Banks are mostly asset-based lenders today. And so for us, we're providing cash flow lending. We're lending against a, a business's enterprise value. If a business is worth you know, $100 million, we're usually going to lend about $50 million. So we're typically attaching it around a 50% loan to value. Um, it's uh, senior secured. So unlike you know, most high-yield bonds, which tend to be subordinated and unsecured, we're top of the capital structure, secured by all the assets of the business. And we're typically, you know, four, four and a half times leverage. And most important is in the lower middle market, where we, uh, you know, spend most of our time. Um, that market still has a lot of protections. It has a lot of covenants. And so, what that means is, when a borrower has its risk position change, they'll trip a covenant. And we have a repricing opportunity and an opportunity to change what we get paid for the risk, which is very different from the high yield bond market. It's really the reason I got into direct lending in the first place. Is I grew up in the high yield bond market. What I hated about it is you buy a 5% bond, that's the most you're going to make on that bond. 
you know, if the risk of that bond changes and suddenly the company's a lot ri more risky, you may not get your money back, but you're never going to be able to increase your rate. Your 5% coupon is your coupon. Uh, in the direct lending business, when there's a change in the risk in the underlying credit, there's a covenant violation, particularly in the lower part of the market where we, where we trade, and you'll have the opportunity to adjust your risk. So that's something we really like. And so to the question, um, Dan, about uh, yields, mm -hmm. our loans typically are anywhere from LIBOR 575, 600. So you know, we usually have about a 1% LIBOR floor. So we're generally earning 6 or 7% on the low end up to low double digits on the high end. Um, and our portfolios uh, typically on an unlevered basis are going to generate kind of a, you know, a mid to high single digit return. Everything we, we do is a current pay vehicle. Um, we usually put some leverage because we're such senior secured. It's, it's pretty low risk assets, pretty secure. So our typical fund, we have a credit invested investor fund, for example, that is paying around an 8% dividend yield current and uses about one to one leverage. That's great. Thank, uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, Clay, you want to... Uh... Talk a bit um, about uh, about um, you know what what you can construct given your mandate at Exonic from a you know like from a yield and total return perspective and what are some of the the, the, the different exposures there? Yeah, sure. Um, if I were uh, if it were a zero rate world, which you point out, uh, I would want to invest in a market that has a systematic tailwind, something like uh, a shortage of housing in this country that we've had for the past thirty years. Um, I'd want the market to be over the counter, not exchange traded, uh, an ability to execute in a bilateral fashion. I'd want it to be liquid. I'd want it to be dislocated. Um, I'd want there to be numerous players that all have different regulatory constraints, be it banks or insurance companies, or even the uh, GSEs that sort of dominate the mortgage market in this country. Um, I would want there to be, I, I would want the players to have different and asymmetry of information, asymmetry of systems and asymmetry of the way that they differentiate themselves from a fundamental perspective. I'd want the market to uh, organically delever, meaning every month it cash flows out and, uh, and turns risk into cash. I'd love for the market to trade at a discount uh, and that's what I'd want to invest in. That effectively is structured credit, uh, and that's what we do. And we do it through uh, RMBS, CMBS, commercial real estate loans, uh, asset-backed securities, uh, et, et cetera. Did I mention dislocated? At times, the market is dislocated. Uh, we look for those pockets. Um, I, I, you know, people say, you know, when will the market be dislocated? I said it's always dislocated. You just have to find the sector that's dislocated. Um, and and so that's what we invest in in uh, in, in bonds. Uh, uh, loans, uh, et cetera, uh, through our vehicles. And, and I think our sort of expectation is a, a cash flow in the mid to high single digits and a total return sort of centered around 10, given the opportunity today. Great, great. TJ? Yeah, I'd say Clay and I probably swim in the same pool, but maybe different lanes. And so I think his background for what we look at is, is applicable to us. And I, you know, just getting into probably what we're looking at today is I'll point out three things. Um, and there's two themes that are consistent with, with the three. One is we believe there are large tangible addressable markets, typically a trillion plus. And two, we think that the credit is, um, the credit quality is still tight, uh, especially when you compare it to some kind of more public corporate lending. So first, uh, within residential mortgage finance, um, everything that doesn't qualify for Fannie or Freddie, um, we, we think, you know, is probably commonly referred to as non-QM. We think that's very interesting. Um, we're active in purchasing the raw receivables and effectuating a securitization. Um, secondly, uh, student loans, in particular, private student loans. And so when you think about that, that notional, that's, that's a trillion and a half. And, and the headline numbers that you'll see in the Wall Street Journal, et cetera, about the delinquencies and the forbearances, that's generally what is um, sitting on the government's balance sheet. And when you dive into what the private market is, so probably the most popular companies are SoFi or Sally Mae, um, we think there's really good risk adjusted returns there and the performance is much, much better. And then I would say third is... Um, credit card lending from the non-bank institutions. So if you think about B of A or Chase or Wells, that's a super private customer, easy access for those people that qualify. There's a whole ecosystem of, of people in that demographic that wants you know, a flexible way to you know, pay for gas, pay for groceries. And there's a lot of specialty finance companies 
out there that are serving them. And so we're very active in providing those companies capital, whether it be in debt or buying the raw receivables, et cetera. And probably on a return perspective, probably similar to play, cash flows being generated in the mid-high single digits. And then there's kind of upside on the exit, whether it's a securitization or a sale, um, that'll probably get us into the low double digits. Great. Okay. So 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 I, I I so we'll start with Aaron, but but same kind of question to the panel, the other panelists as well, right? So like for the audience here, help help reconcile, right? So you've got, you know, you can buy HYG right now and get a you know high yield, you know, popular high yield ETF and get a, a 4% yield, right? And I think you know, you don't have to be a specialist. You just look at the financial press, right? And, and I think the press does a good job of kind of conveying like just about any corporate, you can put your hand up and say, hey, I, you know, I, I need to raise money and you can raise money pretty easily in the in the environment that we're in. So very wide open kind of capital markets, right? And so reconcile that to why would a good company that's been around for a long time, right? be willing to, you know, uh, to, or, or be forced to, I guess, is the market kind of forces them to pay that higher yield, right? Like, so, you know, along with Monroe, there are a handful of other, you know, really good middle market uh, direct lenders that that have been doing an excellent job generating exceptional risk adjusted returns in the current environment, right? But it, it doesn't always tie, I think, unless you're deep in the market, in credit markets, you don't necessarily appreciate why that exists, right? Why does that inefficiency exist where you can pick up you know, three or four points in yield. So maybe talk through that for the group and also the, the, what the trade is there, right? So in some cases it's going to be, you know, illiquidity, right? So you have to have a different kind of duration of capital. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think what's important to understand is that, you know, it depends on where you are in the market. So it's specifically to middle market finance, which is the business that we're active in. Um, when you get into the high side of middle market finance, the larger middle market companies, which are you know typically going to be 75 million of EBITDA and up, you know there is there are more alternatives for companies of that size. You know they can look to um, you know selective high yield issuance in some cases even investment grade issuance. When you get down into the space where Monroe traffics, you know the three to 30 million of EBITDA kind of borrower, there is no bond market for those borrowers. There is no alternative source of capital other than maybe going to a bank for a first lien sort of asset-based finance and maybe a, a hedge fund or a, a mezzanine lender for that mez piece. What we provide them is a one-stop shop. Most of what we're doing today is, is working with a middle market private equity firm who's buying the company. And it's really the only way that they can you know, create their levered investment in a borrower is through a, a firm like ours. And so what is an investor taking on when they take on an investment in a Monroe fund versus a high yield index? Or, um, or even an investment grade index, well, obviously we're paying a higher yield and there is nothing that's free. So we must be taking on some risk that you aren't taking on if you are in a, in a high grade bond. And so I think what you're taking on is a couple things. One is um, there's clearly less liquidity in what we do than there is in the both high grade market and, in, and even the high yield market, right? So when we originate a loan, it's a $100, $150 million loan, it's going into all the Monroe funds, I can't sell that loan easily for the price that I originated with that. I can, when things are good, I can certainly syndicate a piece of it at the time. But if I close that loan and we get a year out and I want to sell that loan, there's probably no one who's going to show up and bid me par. Or maybe there is, but it's not going to be so easy. It's going to be negotiated. There's no market. And so there's definitely a liquidity premium in what we do. Um, and so <laughs> they can uh, still see us. So we're... <laughs> I don't think they like the answer. Um, there's, a, there's a liquidity premium there for sure. And then at the end of the day, there's also a, a bit of a timing issue, right? So a lot of times we're called upon to do a loan where we need to move quickly because there's a transaction that needs to close. And, you know, the bond market may take longer to underwrite. There's a registration process, you know, everything's privately negotiated. And so a lot of our borrowers are willing to pay a little bit more for certainty of execution, timing of execution. Uh, particularly in our in our um, opportunistic credit business, which is a subset of what we do, more asset focused lending, it overlaps a little bit more with what these guys do. We do some specialty finance lending. Those tend to be things that need to move quickly, close quickly, and the the price that we're charging is not usually the determinant of why we're selected. It's more about the flexibility and the capital we provide. And the last piece I'll just mention is, it's not it's not untrue that we're going to push out on the leverage side a lot more than a bank would do. So our typical loan is four and a half times EBITDA. You're not going to see a lot of banks hold on their balance sheet for a four and a half times EBITDA kind of leverage. So it's a little bit more leverage. So it comes down to really fundamental good credit underwriting. And our track record is that we go out and, and you know, try to make sure we don't lose a lot of money. The lending business is easy. The way you make money is you don't lose money. 
Um, sounds dumb, but that's the bottom line. You don't get paid enough to take a lot of risks, so you got to really underwrite well. And I think that's um, that's really what we're trying to do every day. No, that, that that's great, Aaron. And yeah, I, I think the, the key point, right, is that it's not it, you know that 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 you appear in the current market to be getting paid well for those risks, right? So if you can, you know, you're generating double or close to the, you know, double the, the, the yield of, of, you know, vanilla unsecured high yield, right? And you're secured, right? Like I, I think that trade-off from a liquidity perspective makes sense all day long, assuming it matches the duration of your capital, right? Um, but it seems like one segment of the market where there's still a lot of income and a lot of value in a you know in a tough environment. Um, so maybe TJ um, talk a bit about you know the different. So obviously structured credit is is you know and so you and we can cover a lot of kind of sub you know sure. sub sections of the market right. But maybe pick one or two to kind of highlight you know drive home this point that you know there's there's a lot of inefficiencies in these markets right and if you're a you're, it, you could be a lazy fixed income investor. You could be mandate constrained as well, right? So it's not just it's not just lazy investors who are only investing in you know on their own IG and high yield. They they may know that it's really it, there's not a lot of value there, but they may be mandate mandate constrained. But you know, imagine an investor who's not mandate constrained, who's still overweight those kind of very vanilla segments of the market right now. You know, what's what's the the simple pitch for a couple of segments of your book, just from a, a, a relative value perspective. Yeah, I, I think just just even from ten thousand feet, if, if you think about what you know, corporations and CFOs are doing, they're doing what they're supposed to do right now. Uh, credit's easy, rates are low, they're extending durations, um, and so I think if you fast forward to five or whatever amount of years, and you know, rates you know do eventually go up, and there are some fundamental concerns, like that's a lot of volatility. And the price of a, a corporate security that's got a 10, 15 year maturity. When you think about a lot of the, the products, just big picture that we're investing in, if you think about residential real estate, it's a great you know, inflation hedge, right? And so if you're worried about sort of the, the inevitable rise in rates, who knows when it's gonna happen, like that's a good place effectively to be secured and be hiding. If you look at a lot of the other consumer asset classes that we're investing in, like I mentioned credit cards as an example, um, you know, generally shorter duration floating rate. And so I think what, what this, you know, space in particular can do um, right now, more so th than other parts of the market, whether it be corporates or munis, is, is offer you yield um, without a lot of duration risk. And I think that really should have a home in a lot of people's portfolio, given sort of the uncertainty of what's going the Fed's going to do and sort of where we are, just, just big picture, you know, mid-2021. That's great. Uh, Clay, maybe a couple of segments of your book you want to highlight. I know the um, the, the the Freddie S SBL portion of the book is fascinating. I think might might be worth taking five minutes to kind of unpack for the group here as a you know a segment of the market that I'm sure a lot of folks won't be familiar with. Exonic um, has really you know has, has developed a relationship with 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 Freddie and, and a real specialization here. So maybe worth highlighting from a from a you know from an opportunity perspective, something that's really unique. Sure. Thank you. And, and I agree with uh, TJ. I, I think you said uh, yield without duration. And effectively, that's just cash flows. Um, and, you know, everybody at my shop, when we look at certain assets or uh, respective investments, we first look at the, the pool of assets, be it residential mortgage loans or commercial mortgage loans or uh, aviation loans, et cetera, uh, and really have a good feeling or uh, forecast out the, the prepayment variability, the default variability, the recovery uh, variability. Um, and then we look at the structure. And it, it, it's really that function of structure that allows us to, to insulate and, uh, and mitigate a, a lot of risk. Uh, you know, I, I think yeah, inflation's here. I, I don't think it's a debate. I, I remain surprised when the Fed tries to convince us that it's transitory. Um, but hard assets are a great uh, position to be in. And you know, specifically our firm, uh, we're not always at the top part of the capital structure. So we're at you know, sort of the part of the capital structure. I, I deem to be that fulcrum part where losses and, and prepayments matter and uh, inflation is only going to support these assets on a go forward basis. So if we can run a lower severity than we had originally sort of forecasted, um, the, the, the bang for your buck or uh, the, the additional yield enhancement is, is quite substantial. 
especially when it's a, a discount asset or a discount bond. Our relationship with Freddie is is uh, is really interesting. We've had a relationship for almost ten years now. Um, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that there's we 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 love a market and we enjoy our market where there's there's regulatory regulatory constraint for other people. Um, banks have to think about their tier one capital. Insurance companies have to think about their NAIC rating. Oh, unless you're in Europe, and then you have to think about solvency or Basel, and those don't always link up. So they're looking at different bonds uh, through different lenses. Um, the GSEs also have the regulatory constraint, and, and uh, President Obama put them into uh, conservatorship. I, I believe it was Christmas Eve, 2010. And what that effectively meant is is that they're supposed to protect taxpayer dollar. Um, at all costs. And so you saw the advent of their risk share programs on the residential side, um, which is generally a reference pool and it's a synthetic asset. You may, may have heard of TAS or Stacker. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a liquid, it's a tradable market. Almost every dealer will make two-way markets on it. The, the way that I think about it, it's much more about spread than it is about cash flow or yield. So um, it's certainly not a core component of our portfolio, but but on the on the uh, on the multifamily side, they uh, Freddie approached us in 2013 and 14 because they wanted a risk share partner from day one when the loan originally gets made. That's evolved through several iterations, but now we're maybe a, a third to to 40 percent of their flows in the small balance lending program. This is for Freddie an eight billion dollar uh, a year program. I, I mentioned small balance because. You know, Freddie has a, from my perspective, sort of a, a dual report of, to both Congress and um, the Treasury, and they're there to support. I mean, it, it's a, it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's not purely financially driven. There's a bit, a bit of a social component, and the small balance program in general is uh, workforce housing. It's Class B multifamily, garden style, low rise, um, you know, two to ten million dollar apartment buildings. And we're their risk share partner on that. So what and that to means, be clear, this is where the, the country is short enough supply of this housing. You, right? you, you need more middle income housing. You know, we, we had this view that it was a defensive um, sector going all the way back to, you know, 2015 to 2020. COVID tested that. Um, we saw rental demands and rent prices decrease in the class A. It actually went up in class B, which is sort of what we would expect. If you're in trouble, if, you, if you're a, a, a class A renter, and that's the you know, that's the, uh, you know, stainless steel uh, refrigerator, granite countertops, you know, that it comes with a yoga mat and costs $2,200 a month. You, you can always downsize to something that's $1,100 a month. You, it doesn't come with a yoga mat, but it, it's, it's, it's a housing and it's still a, a, a two bed, one bath or three bed, two bath. And, and that's, the, uh, that's the asset that we like. Call it workforce housing. Uh, it works. For us, if, if you were to invest, these, invest in these, and I know there's a, a lot of uh, managers of money out here, and there's probably room for um, uh, uh, multifamily, multifamily equity. That cap rate, I mean, I guess it depends on where you are, but in New York City, it probably starts with a three. If, if you're in a, a tier three or tertiary market, maybe you're lucky to get something that starts with a five. Um, we're getting 9%. How are we doing that? Well, I'll tell you, the, 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 the loan is... I don't know, call it uh, three to 4% um, to the consumer. And that's for approximately a, a 70 LT, L, LTV mortgage. So there's 30% sponsor equity below you. And our partnership, uh, we come in at, at, a, uh, at a layered slice. So we're sort of that um, with a zero to 10 on the loan. So when I think about it in terms of the capital structure of an apartment building, we're effectively that 30 to 37% part of the capital structure uh, in the apartment building, if the loan is you know, three to 4%, the reason why we get 9% is because our partner is Freddie Mac. Freddie ha has the lowest cost of capital in the world. They're guaranteeing the top 90% of this loan, and that trades with a one handle. So when you look at uh, a loan that's, that's uh, zero to 70 and 63% and, and, uh, of that trades with a one handle, it allows us to, uh, uh, you know, we, we can make something like 9%. So that's, that's a, uh, it's a cherished relationship. Uh, if you're in the, if you're in the uh, structured credit world or the RMBS or CMBS world, I, I, you go down to, to Washington, D.C. at least once a quarter. Uh, I've been doing that since I was on the sell side at Goldman, you know, starting in 2002, and that's just the way it is. But it's a, uh, it's a great partnership. The, the, the loan de-risks. It's, um, it doesn't extend, you mentioned sort of, 
high yield and IG, to me that's terrifying because you're only subject to spread um, and the loan doesn't organically de-risk. So when it comes time to uh, try to sell the loan, you're subject to somebody else telling you what price they want to pay for it. And something that's pro rata in the capital structure gets it amortizes down every month. Um, and I'd much rather take reinvestment risk than uh, than longer duration non cash flow risk. Clay, uh, no, that, that that's great, Clay. Really, really, uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, and I think drives home right the you know this this, this as as everybody in this room knows right, or as, as most know right. Skybridge is is an alternative asset manager, right? And and we 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 believe deep down right that markets are inefficiency and alternatives it, it, that are persistently inefficient and and you know alternative strategies make sense and and hedge funds add a lot of value, right? And I think that. An example like that uh, from Clay, right? Like that, I think if you're if you're a professional hedge fund investor, you what what Clay just sketched out there with Freddie and that relationship and the ability to source that that paper, right? Like it's a you, the terminology you'd use is that's a key part of their alpha proposition, right? Something very very unique that they're able to do to deliver, you know, a unique return stream to investors in a world, again, going back to the name of the panel, that, you know, it seems like there's not that much to do. There's a ton to do, right? But it, it's hard. It's hard work, right? That's why, that's why um, uh, you know, specialist managers like this exist. To, to, they, have, they have the resource and the ability to focus and extract value. Um, why don't we go to you, Aaron, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you, TJ, and, and talk a bit in your market, right? So, Again, it goes back to the same idea of you need to source those loans, right? And so for a, you know for for a direct lender, right? That's that's no easy feat, right? I, I, a lot of the audience probably doesn't appreciate, right? That this is you know you're doing this from A to Z. Um, and so talk a bit about you know what Monroe's team looks like from a you know from a loan origination perspective, what that process looks like, you know, in the two minute version. Yeah, for sure. So if you talk to any direct lender, every one of them will talk about proprietary origination, big buzzword. Most of them don't really know what it means because their proprietary origination is just calling one of the Wall Street banks and asking for a big allocation on a deal. That's not very proprietary because I can buy the same deal. Uh, maybe I don't have the relationship and maybe I can't get 75 million of it. Maybe I can only get 20. But it's not, there's a big loan and they're going to take a little piece of it right. versus doing it exactly. from scratch. Yeah. So what do we do that's different? Um, we have close to 20 full-time loan originators. All they do is go out and look for loan opportunities from Monroe to agent and own. So we'll typically be the only lender or, in, or the agent lender where we'll structure the loan and then we'll bring in a partner and maybe we'll get a small piece of it. And so that's a very expensive proposition for a firm like ours to hire 20 full-time people. And at the end of the day, when as investors, when you're looking at what am I paying for when I'm investing in funds like ours, you ought to be paying for some sort of uh, alpha, right? And so much of the direct lending business has become beta because it's what I first described, buying things off the street. That's, that's beta business. I mean, maybe you can generate a little alpha by being better than the next guy in underwriting. But at the end of the day, you better be providing something that's unique. And so when you're into a Monroe product, for example, you're going to have a bunch of loans that you're not going to be able to get anywhere else because we've gone out and sourced them. We've invested in the people over our 17-year history to go out and find these opportunities and source them. And it's through relationships. It's through um, you know lawyers and bankers and accountants and boutique investment bankers and private equity firms. And uh, it's not to say that we don't compete on rate and that there isn't competition. There certainly is, but relationship matters. And the reason relationship matters is because we don't just give them the money and then they never talk to us again, right? We've got covenants. And so they want to have a relationship so that if something happens, they know who they're talking to and they can try to work out something and we don't just take the keys and run with their businesses. And so relationship matters and you can source based on a relationship. And that's what Monroe does. That's what differentiates us from most people in the lower middle market, particularly um, is the size and breadth of our origination. TJ, maybe. And, and I guess, TJ, you can answer the question from a couple of perspectives, right? So you have the, the larger Angelo Gordon, right. right? Which I think is maybe important to touch on very briefly, but then also, you know, your world, structured credit as well, right? So a lot of value from sure. kind of sourcing. Sure. I mean, listen, I, we, we have a huge corporate business where we can, you know, JV on things within the specialty finance world. And we've done that. Um, over time from like, you know, shorting Hertz into COVID into looking at some of the uh, mortgage originators coming out of COVID uh, and their high yield bonds. But I mean, I think Clay walked you through like how you can partner with the government. And then I think there's the other way of looking at it in that a lot of consumer finance is subsidized by the government. So if you think about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, 
And if you think about most of the student loan origination going on today for undergrads is, is the direct program, which goes right onto Treasury's balance sheet. And so you can either work with them, like, like Clay walked you through an example, or you go to where they're not. And, and so I talked about, uh, you know, non-QM. And so that's where um, you, know, you have to have the infrastructure. You talk about a team. You know, we have 35 investment professionals to sort of, you know, build that mousetrap to go basically capture that excess return to where the government isn't making it easy and cheap. Same concepts with student loan. And so I think that's how we really think about things in the sense of there's obviously a lot of money out there. And so we're trying to focus on areas that have just large, like tangible adjustable markets and that um, there's enough to go around. Um, we, we, we shouldn't be drastically seeing price changes quarter over quarter or even year over year. And so we can kind of really understand the product, understand the credit. Um, we're generally kind of in a similar place in the capital structure that Clay walked you through. And so getting the credit is 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 crucial to, to your um, ultimate return. And that's really how we how we like to, to play things and looking where either the government or the large banks are sort of not playing. And, and just based on the size of the economy, you know, even just thinking about U.S., there's plenty of notion to play with. Very cool. Um, maybe so. So we only have a few minutes left, but. Um, the high level question, right? And I think the answers may be different um, given the different market kind of focuses here. So given, you know, with the, with the, with the, the COVID shock to markets last year, right? I think that, you know, Clay and TJ, you tell me, I, I, I think that there are less well-capitalized competitors in your space, right? So you're, oper you, you're probably seeing a little less competition than you were a couple of years ago. And, it's, and, and both of your firms emerged very strongly from you know, the shock that was last year. Um, where Monroe, I don't think that's going to be the case, right? I, I think that direct lending you know, held up very well throughout the, the kind of COVID shock um, uh, early last year. And so, but maybe, you know, just, just put a finer point on that. You know, would you say that it's a, it's any, like from a competition perspective, even better than it was several years ago or about the same? What would you say, Clay? I, I mean, sure. Uh, COVID killed several of our competitors. Um, All right, there you go. Well stated plainly. There you go. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 but by the way, it also wasn't a function of asset selection. It was a function of liability structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love um, it. There was a, a, a massive, uh, uh, run on liquidity and, and something that I saw play out faster and deeper and more severe than the financial crisis between 2007 and 2009. Um, but it's, it's why you don't over lever. Um, and, and you think, you think really carefully about asset selection. I love what Aaron said, uh, because I, I think about it, it's uh, true in our own business. Uh, buying cheap bonds is really cool and, and fun but not buying bad bonds is actually sort of the, the, the key to our business and, and I think the key to success. Um, you know, we, we went into COVID with uh, 14 repo counterparties, uh, diversified the, the days of roll, uh, meaning different, different days of the month, uh, the term uh, um, and the amount. And, and now we're, we have eight counterparties. And it wasn't a function of uh, them not wanting to work with us. We don't want to work with them. So we really saw who, who good partners were uh, during COVID. And we're trying to do more with those key relationships on, uh, on our side. But listen, I mean, th this remains uh, an inefficient market that, that we enjoy. And I sort of pinch myself every day being able to come to work and, and, uh, and, 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 and find good bonds or, or good positions that cash flow organically out um, and uh, having less competitors, I would say in our sort of specialized field, but even, you know, TJ talks about a total addressable market. Yeah, you're right. It's giant. And it's also, um, it's also taken by global insurance companies and global banks that have regulatory constraints on their capital. So what's left over, it tends to always be the cheapest. And, you know, maybe it's because it's part of the fulcrum, uh, the fulcrum and the, and the securitization, but that's what we like. Um, we want to be paid and, and we think that we uh, earn our earn our keep or earn our money by being right about those those uh, those credits. Yeah, I think this is like also like the second culling of our competitor. Like there was kind of a, a small washout, I would say, after like that Q4, 15, Q1, 16 high yield, you know, you know, mini blow up. Uh, and then this was was kind of the round two. And so I think th there's less of us that I think are sort of dedicated to the space to sort of pursue, pursue those opportunities kind of in earnest on a full-time basis, not being tourists. 
Yep. Okay. Aaron, last word. Well, you know, Clay said it right. I mean, there's really three things that carries out funds. It's credit selection or investment selection problems. It's sources of leverage funding and it's sources of equity funding, right? And, and you know, a lot of hedge funds saw all three a problem during COVID, right? They picked the wrong assets that blew out in spreads. Their leverage went away. Their repo counterparties pulled. And in some cases, their equity investors also, their, their hedge fund investors pulled and redeemed. And so that, that's the perfect storm, right? It's terrible. And so at the end of the day, um, I think it's important you think about that when you're investing in the funds. You know, what are the sources of risk to you that are beyond just the manager? The manager selecting, it's how do they manage their business? And so just for us, we're focused a lot on that. So our, most of our capital is long-term and locked up, and most of our credit is long-term and locked up. So then we isolate it really at the end of the day to credit selection, and that's something that we do great. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Aaron, TJ, Clay, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.